It's so good to see you guys this morning and to be here. Um, a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night, um, I did a teaching on the Trinity. How many were in that class that Wednesday? Yeah, several of you were there. Um, we've been doing a series on Wednesday nights called The Ways of God, and um, I don't know if anybody has. I've been kind of blessed by it, but it's been, it's been neat. And we talked about the Trinity, and after, the, after that night, after the teaching that night, I just felt uh, impressed by the Holy Spirit to kind of take some of the things that we talked about that night and emphasize a part of it that is, I believe, a word from the Lord for, for us as a body. And, and so the title of this message uh, this morning is, You Are Invited to the Dance. You're invited to the dance. And uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it just has to be one of my favorite all-time passages of Scripture. I want you to listen to these words, and, and, and we're going to talk about this this morning. Paul says, Colossians 2, 9 and 10, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and over every authority. Isn't that a beautiful? Oh, man. The New Living Translation does it this way. It says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are complete through your union with Christ. Or the King James Version that I memorized 100 years ago when Jim and I used to walk around together um, <laughs> uh, this way, this way I memorized it. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. Oh, man. What does it mean? As you go through the scriptures, you find that there are a lot of things in the creation and a lot of things in the kingdom of God that, uh, that come in threes, trinities, the trinity of graces, uh, faith, hope, and love, the trinity of the human person, uh, our mind, our body, and our spirit, uh, our body, soul, and spirit, however you want to talk about it, the phases of our life on earth, birth, and life, and death. A family is most complete uh, when there is a trinity operating of a father and a mother and the children. There's a trinity of blessing and providence that's revealed in scriptures through tithes and offerings and alms. It's the way that God takes care of us. There's a trinity of time, our past and our present and our future. Uh, the earth was separated from the waters on the third day of creation, and it made the earth complete and habitable then for all of the other creation that God did, the animals and people and plants and everything else. But it began on the third day when God made the earth complete by separating the land and the waters. Um, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, making the provision for our salvation and for eternal life complete by not only his death but his resurrection. The number three is used 523 times in the Bible. And there's a reason why it seems like the whole of creation, all three realms of creation that Paul talks about in Philippians 2, he says on things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, another, another trinity, there's a reason why all of creation shouts out with the number three. And the number three is like a signature of God. And you find his sim signature stamped all over creation. And it's there because three is the number of the personal completeness of God. The personal completeness of God, the fullness of who God is, the, the completion or the completeness of all that He does is expressed in the number three. 
And that revelation, as you go from Genesis to the book of Revelation, as you see that over and over again, and then as you look out onto what God has made, and, and you see over and over and over again these, these threes, this, this cycle, this completed circle, you see it over and over again, and it led the people of God back in the early days of, of the church to, to uh, describe God as a triune Godhead the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three God, all three and yet one. We don't serve three gods. Christians don't have three gods. The Bible doesn't teach three gods. It teaches one God, but somehow he reveals himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we call that the Trinity. It's the number of divine completeness. Uh, for those of you that like math, the, the number three is uh, you know, one plus one plus one equals three. One times one times one equals one. Isn't that cool? And so it is with God that our God is both uh, three in one and one in three. Anybody like math? I don't either, but <laughs> it's cool. Pretty cool. Someone says, I don't believe in the Trinity because the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. And uh, someone, people here have said that to me since I've lived in Hutchinson. A couple people said, I don't believe in the Trinity because that word is not in the Bible. And, and boy, you're right, it's not. But then neither is the phrase the rapture. That's not in the Bible. The millennium, not in the Bible. The word missions, Missionary, evangelism, not in the Bible. My wifey and I wasted 12 years of our life doing something unbiblical. We were missionaries, and there's no missionary mentioned in the Bible. Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? Uh, in fact, sermon, the word sermon isn't in the Bible. We're wasting our time here this morning. There's no word sermon in the Bible. See, the fact is that there are a lot of words in our Christian vocabulary that are not in the Bible. And uh, you know, show me the phrase faith healing. You know, it's not in the Bible. Intercessory prayer, not in the Bible. Pentecostal, we're Pentecostal Christians. That's an oxymoron in the Bible. Pentecostal Christian, what do you mean you're a Pentecostal? What other kind of Christian is there? That's what they would say in the first century. Uh, there was no, there, you can't find the word Pentecostal in the Bible. These are just words and phrases that have developed over the years as God's people have found a teaching or a truth revealed in Scripture. And even though the word itself isn't used, it describes a body of teaching or a, it describes a body of truth. Uh, I mean, even the word Bible isn't in the Bible. So... Yeah. So that logic doesn't go very far. Uh, but yet, <laughs> I don't believe in the Bible because the word Bible isn't in the Bible. That'll give you a headache. And yet, from the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew name that is used in that very first sentence is a plural name. Uh, it's not El, which is God singular, but Elohim, which is the Hebrew plural. And yet when it's translated, the word Elohim, when it's translated and when it's pronounced, when it's read, is not gods or the gods. You don't read in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. You don't read that. What you read is God, this singular person with a plural name in verse 18 says, let us make man in our image. Who's he talking to? What's going on? There's something about God in the very beginning that he starts revealing to us and yet he never labels it. He just declares it. It's never proven, 
never shown, scribbled out for us in mathematical, logical sense. It's just something that's revealed to us through the Scriptures. John, in the very beginning of the New Testament, says in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. How does that work? In verse, verse 14, he says that this same Word who was God in the beginning became flesh and dwelled among us. And he begins his teaching about Jesus, God the Son. All through the Scriptures, the God of the Bible is revealed somehow as one and three. And no one knows exactly how it's done. It's just declared. It's just there. I want you to just for a moment listen to Jesus, the language that he uses as he speaks of himself and his Father and the Holy Spirit in John 14, how the three purses of the Godhead are woven together in this statement. And it just, if you can just get the picture in your mind of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, like this beautiful dance interacting with each other. He says, 14, 15 to 23, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. That phrase, all three persons of the Godhead are revealed. I I will ask, the Son will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Isn't that something? Who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I'm not going to abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Wait, Wait a minute now. You just said the Holy Spirit's coming to you. And now you're saying, I'm coming to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. And when I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Is your head ready to explode yet? Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, My Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. We can't really comprehend or figure out logically how God can be one and three and three and one. We, we try to explain it with illustrations like the egg. You know, he's, it's the shell and the white and the yolk, and yet it's all egg. Or, or water, which is water, but it can be uh, liquid or it can be in a gas or it can be in a solid. Uh, even human beings, the body, the soul, the, uh, the, the spirit, um, And these are pictures that give us an idea of three in one, and yet none of them are exactly the way God is, because God is so much more than than what we can try to figure out. As I said, His stamp is over all of creation. His signature is everywhere you look, all these threes, but, but He is more than that. One of the best things that the revelation of God as a holy trinity does for us is it causes us to humble ourselves and say that we love and serve a God whom not only his ways but his person, who he is, is way, way, way beyond our comprehension, way past finding out, way past figuring out. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I am so thankful that you have a God that's beyond your ability to divine. Amen? Beyond your ability to figure out. 
because it makes it easy to worship him because he's bigger than we are. If we could just, if we could get him all reduced down to human categories and put him in a box, he wouldn't be much of a God. And God is so other than you and other than me and other than anything in his creation. And yet he loves us like this. He talks to us like this. I'm I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm walking with you, but shall the Spirit will be in you. That's incredible to think about a God like that. That's not my intention this morning to work hard at trying to prove the Trinity because the Bible doesn't. Like I said, the Bible simply declares who God is. But the question that I want us to think about this morning is what did Paul mean by this? What did Paul mean when he says, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought into fullness? What's he saying there? You are complete in him. What is, what is, how does the Trinity affect our lives? And uh, I've already mentioned how it initially affects us. I think that when we begin to see God in three persons, uh, a true mystery, real, uh, totally unsolvable, and yet there he is, that when we begin to grasp that, our initial reaction is to be humbled at such an amazing God. It should humble us. Hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you and just say, you know, God should humble you. He really should. (laughs) Yeah, God should humble you. The fact is that the mystery of the Trinity uh, keeps all of creation humble, not just human beings but all of creation, Uh, that His ways uh, we just cannot understand. There's things about God, there's things about what He does that we just can't understand, and that humbles us. But that same reaction is not just for us. It happens with other parts of the created realm as well. This isn't just for human beings. Uh, Think for a moment about the angels of God. Think about the angels and what they do and where they live. Think about the seraphim, the fiery ones. These are guys who stand right next to the throne of God. They're called fiery ones because they're they're created to withstand the, the brightness and the beauty of the glory of God. Human beings can't, but these these beings have been created to withstand that kind of glory, and they stand at the throne of God and do the bidding of the Lord, and, 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 and think of the cherubim and the seraphim, and think of the archangels, Michael and Gabriel. Think about the angels of the Lord that live in the throne room of God. Is there anything that they could possibly have to take God by faith about? Is there anything about God that they haven't seen, that they haven't heard, that they don't know? I mean, they, they, they live their lives in the brightness of His glory. When, when, when the Father speaks to the Son, when there's a conversation going on, they hear it. Isn't that awesome to think about? The angels hear the Spirit of God. They hear the Father speaking to the... They, they hear the Lord in His divine fullness. That's, that's amazing to me to think about. When God says, let us do this, or that, let us bless Ron, they hear that. They know what's going on. I just, I can't, I can't imagine that. They've seen and experienced things about God that we can't even get our head around. We look up at the angels and we think, man, wouldn't it be cool to be an angel? Wouldn't it be amazing to to, to see God the way the angels see God? That's amazing. And yet, the Bible says, the angels look at you. They look at human beings and say the same thing. They look at your life. They look at God, what God has done for you, and they say, man, or 
Maybe they don't use man. I don't know. What's an angel explicative? Because you know, the tongues of angels. You know, I don't know. But anyway, they say something and then they say, what must it be like to be a human? That's amazing. We live within sight of the King of kings and the God of gods every day. What would it be like to trust and believe in Him and never see Him? We've never experienced faith. We don't know what that is. We see God. They don't. And yet they believe in Him. They trust Him. They follow Him. They cry out to Him. We've never experienced sin like, like, like humans have experienced sin. We, we don't have a clue what God's grace feels like. We don't have a clue what forgiveness feels like. We don't have a clue about hope. What is that even? Wow. What does it feel like to be adopted into the family of God? Man, it must really be cool to be a human. <laughs> That's what the angels say. Humans are lucky. The angels have never experienced the things God has done for us. They can only take God's mercy. They can only take God's forgiveness by faith. We know that God is a merciful God. We've never experienced it, but he reveals himself as a merciful God, and so we know it must be true. But you've experienced his mercy. You know it's true by experience. Isn't that incredible? Peter says in, uh, he talks about this in 1 Peter 1.12. He says that the angels could only watch in amazement as God's plan of salvation was unfolding among human beings. And it's when he says in verse 9, you, man, the prophets prophesied about it, the angels looked at it, but they couldn't enter in, and, 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 but you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You guys are a people set apart from God. You that live on this side of the cross, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Unbelievable how, the generation that you are. The richness of his love and his glory are unsearchable. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eye has not seen or ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Our God is a great God, and, and the, the triune God keeps all of creation in awe and wonder and humility. And that is a great, great place for you to live. Hallelujah. It's really good for you to walk humbly with your God. Hallelujah. But as great and as awesome and as past finding out the triune God is, there's another side of him, something else that he does for us, something close and something personal. The one is kind of on the macro scale, but this, this idea is about you, and it's where Paul's statement comes in. He says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him. This word Godhead is a direct reference to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we've seen, this three is the number of div divine completeness, divine wholeness, fulfillment, and here's the deal, that wholeness has been offered to you, that completeness has been offered to you, what does that mean? Think of all the things that God is, all the things that God does that require more than one person. Is anybody's brain starting to feel a little bit like it might be Boiling just, to, okay, good. Well, just, just let it go from your brain down into your spirit because I want to talk to your spirit now for a minute. There's so much about who God is that can't be done 
alone. The Bible says very clearly, God is love. Amen? God is love. And yet God, love doesn't work alone. Love alone is called narcissism. (laughs) It's called selfishness. And God is not selfish. God is selfless. And God is love. And it takes at least two people for love to happen. Joy. It's empty if it's not shared. Compassion. Friendship. Conversation. Esteem. Help. Believing in someone. Forgiving someone. Having mercy. Uh, showing grace, giving and receiving, all of those beautiful things that come from the hand of God and all the things that make living so meaningful. All of those things uh, require at least two people in order for them to operate. And as a trinity, God enjoys all of those relational joys and more in himself. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. God was love long before He created human beings. The Bible says God is is love. He didn't become love when He created you. He is love. He is mercy. He is good. Hallelujah. He is great. He is all of those, all the fullness. And he enjoyed that all through eternity within himself. This beautiful, eternal dance of life flowing between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he gets an idea, let us make man in our image. And you didn't come from the zoo to the, or the goo to the zoo to you. That didn't happen. He created you. Because you, the, you know, I, don't, I haven't ever, ever seen any glop that has the image of God. Some of us are pretty gloppy, but still, you're image bearers. Jesus Christ came into the world fully God. That's what Paul is saying here now. Fully human and fully God. That's another mystery that should make us worship. It's another thing we can't get our heads around. How God can be full, how Jesus can be fully man and fully God. I don't know. But that's what the Bible teaches. And for 33 and a half years in Jesus, all the fullness of God dwelled in a human body and walked the earth. And the beautiful dance. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit was lived out in front of us on the earth for 33 and a half years. That's what Jesus was trying to talk about in John, the passage I read to you. Jesus is just showing this beautiful dance that goes on in the triune Godhead. And Jesus is a part of that. And when he departed and returned to the Father, the Bible says that he sent us the Holy Spirit. And we saw that happen on the day of Pentecost. And the eternal dance of the Trinity just keeps on going on in heaven and on earth. And Paul says, because of Jesus, because God became flesh, because he went to the cross, The work that he did there, rising from the dead on the third day, completing the way and the means for your salvation and for mine. All the fullness of God, complete perfection of who he is, his complete love, his forgiveness, his mercy, all of those things suddenly through Jesus became available to you. So that you, your life can now be full. You can be whole. You can be made complete and wanting nothing and lacking in nothing. In Jesus, the dance goes on And he is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
And now, because of that, he invites you to the dance. That's Paul's picture. Get that picture in your mind. Jesus is God holding out his hands to you and to me, saying, come on and join me. There's room for you in this dance. This dance of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to expand it so that now it's the Father and the Son and the Spirit and the Bride. Hallelujah. In Him was all the fullness of the Godhead. He didn't need us. He didn't need us. But on the cross, He reaches out His hand to you and says, Come. Join in the dance. And you are made complete in Him. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Our triune God is complete and full, in need of no one to enjoy the beauty of who He is and what He's created. And there's things about our God that we'll never comprehend. There's things about our God that the angels who live in His presence don't comprehend. It's because He's God. And as amazing as that eternal dance of life with the Father and the Son and the Spirit is, God in His unmeasurable selfless love has reached out His hands on the cross so that you and everybody that you know join the dance. Be made whole. Be made complete. In Him. Hallelujah. Enter into that eternal life, that dance of life with God Himself. Will you bow your heads with me for just a moment? There is room for you in this dance. In the book of Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come to the Lord Jesus. There's room for you. And perhaps you're here this morning and you've been wrestling with an emptiness inside of you, a part of your life that is just so vacant and so where you feel so incomplete there's a lack of fullness a lack of wholeness a place where you are broken for some of you some of you it's because you, you've never you've never known that you were invited to the dance you didn't know that there's a place for you in this life that there is salvation and there is joy and there is peace and wholeness for you You didn't know that. For others of us, you were raised in a home or in a place where you thought that God was this really angry scorekeeper looking for you to mess up because if you mess up, that gives him an excuse to walk away from you and you've lived in that your whole life. That your shortcomings... Your weaknesses are an excuse for God to stay away from you. And that's been your image of God in your mind. An image put there by dead religion, put there by a lot of just junk. Because the God of the Bible is a beautiful and complete, fulfilled Father complete, fulfilled Son, complete, fulfilled Spirit. And He whirls through eternity in a dance of life, a relationship, and love. And in that dance, Jesus reaches out His hand to you. He did it on the cross. 
And he said, I want you to come with me. I'm extending my life to include you. I'm extending my love to include you. I'm extending my kingdom to include you. Join me in the dance. And be made whole. Let God come and fill the empty hole that is in your life. Just as God is complete, three in one, you are made complete in him. Perhaps you've never received Christ as your Savior. It doesn't mean that you don't believe in God. And I'm not talking about being a member of a church. I'm talking about you've never, you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and save you from your sins and be your Lord and include you in eternal life. You've never said, God, it's you and me. It's one-on-one. -on -one, it's personal, and I need you to forgive me and give me life. And you've just never done that before. You might be the most religious person here, and that's great. I'm glad that you're a good person, but, but you're not a part of the dance. And you know it because there's an emptiness inside of you. And you'd say, Pastor Lee, I want to receive Christ. I, I want to be complete in him. I don't want to just believe in God. I want to walk with God. I want to dance with God. I want to have eternal life. If that's in your heart this morning, I want you to just slip up your hand because I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want to pray for you. And we're going to pray. He's already invited you. He's already invited you. So it's not like he's resistant to you at all. He loves you. He loves you and he just wants a chance to give you life and to make you fulfilled. And so we're going to pray. And if you would just repeat this prayer after me. And congregation, would you just help these guys? And we're going to pray this prayer together. And you just pray it after me, okay? Lord Jesus, I thank you for inviting me to have eternal life, to join you in the dance of life. Thank you that you want to give me peace. You want me to experience forgiveness for my sins. You want to fill up this hole that's in my life. So now I acknowledge that I am a sinner. There are things that, that are wrong inside of me. But would you forgive me? And would you save me from my sins? I take your hand, Jesus, and by faith, I join you in the dance. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me fullness. I call you my Lord and my Savior now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, hallelujah. Now listen, hallelujah, yeah. Now here's the deal. Now that you've prayed the prayer, this prayer, John says um, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, wash away all of our unrighteousness. So that's happened when you prayed that prayer. And from this day forward, things are going to start changing in your life. You know, they just Things are going to be different as you begin to grow in the things of God. And it's okay that you don't understand everything. It's all right. We're going to help you with that's what we're here for. That's what the church is here for, to help you to grow and to, and to learn and to become somebody who walks with God every day. But what you're going to start noticing is that that empty feeling that you've had is going to start going away. Because Jesus, by faith, in the, when we just prayed, he's begun 
even now, he is filling you. He is filling up. You are made complete in him, and you are now in him. Is that awesome? You're now in him. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, we seal this prayer that these dear ones have prayed. We ask that the Holy Spirit of fullness would come upon them. And Lord, that they would begin to experience their salvation, that they would have that experiential knowledge of God that your word tells us is for us. And that their life would never be the same because now they are a part of you. They are a part of the bride, Christ. Bless them, I pray, O oh Lord. Bless their families. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys want to go over there, they've got some a gift for you to kind of help you get started. Thank you, guys. Bless you. Yes, God bless you. Bless you. Now, <laughs> isn't it awesome? So good. I just, uh, there's some folks here, though, this morning, before we go, um, and I don't want to belabor this, but some, some of us here in this room, you've done that. You've done what these guys just did. You've prayed that prayer. You've, you've, you've done that, and yet there's, there's places in your life that are still just, just empty. And it's not because God has let you down, it's because you've let some things into your life that, that, that pull you, that keep you at a crossroads, that keep you from the fullness that he has for you. And we do it out of ignorance, we do it for a lot of different reasons. The fact is we do it, we're people. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't love you, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't have fullness for you. It means that sometimes we need to rededicate ourselves to Jesus and say, you know, I, I did that and then I started following my old way again. I started listening to my friends again. I started going down this road again and I messed up and I want to get right with God. And that's for all of us because we all get there from time to time, don't we? I mean, every one of us, including your pastor, is, you know, sometimes we run off the road. With this thing, it's easy to run off the road. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that God doesn't quit reaching out his hand to us and saying, come on. Come back. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. You need, to, you need to come back. You need to just rededicate your heart and your life to Jesus, serving him and living for him. Because you've found yourself kind of getting off the way. Is God talking to you? If that's in your heart, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It happens. It's not anything to be ashamed of. It's just something to get fixed. Like when you get a flat tire on your car, you don't, you're not ashamed. Oh, I'm so ashamed of my flat tire. No, you just get fixed. Jesus, you see these hands. More importantly, Lord, you see our hearts and you see these dear ones who just need to get back on the road. Who, just because of life, we get pulled, we get drawn in wrong directions, we make bad decisions. We wind up with emptiness where there used to be fullness. And you love us so much, Lord, that you come with your forgiveness and your grace. And the beautiful voice of the Holy Spirit says, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Jesus, these who've raised their hands are being honest with us. And so would you just begin whispering into their ears? Would you just begin showing us, Lord, that place where we need to get right, where we need to get back on the road, and we need to join the dance of life again? Lord, we lay ourselves bare before you. You know it all anyway. So we just get honest with ourselves and rededicate ourselves to loving you and living for you. We thank you for what you will do with that, Lord. It's amazing what a God who is so incredible that he is three and one. It's amazing what God can do with that. And we thank you for it, Lord. 
I pray blessing on every person in this room, every family that's represented here, Lord. That Jesus, you would bless your people with peace and with grace. Go with us to our homes, O oh God, and bless our families and our homes with your presence. Let this be a day of rejoicing that we are a part of a beautiful dance. It goes on for eternity that we have eternal life in Christ and we are made whole people in him. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I love you guys. You have a great week. Be good.